second session, we have now the talk by Chris uh, Wilson. And please have a seat and let's uh, start with uh, Chris' uh, talk. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Wilson. So I'm at the Institute for Quantum Computing, obscured there at the University of Waterloo. Um, I would like to join everyone in thanking the speakers for having me uh, to this lovely location for this nice conference, um, break the, the pandemic drought. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing over the last couple of years on analog quantum assimilation of topological models with parametric cavities. So we'll kind of touch on a couple of topics of the conference, which is microwave photons, and then hopefully getting towards many body physics. Um, so these are some of, so um, Jamal, Dima, and Jimmy are students and postdocs who've done most of the experimental work. Um, Ibrahim, our fab guy, Sanbo Chang, who's now with Nakamura in Tokyo, helped develop the platform, um, and Zheng Shi is a, a theorist who helps, who helps a lot with the latter part of the talk that we'll see. And then also kind of the first experiment I'll talk about, um, uh, we got help from Enrique, Enrique Solano's group and in particular Enrique Rico. <coughs> Um, since I know it's not, um, uh, you know, it's not a quantum computing audience necessarily, I want to define these words of saying I'm doing analog quantum simulation. So what does that mean, right? Um, so analog simulation actually has a long history um, in electronics, um, and even before that with mechanical analog simulators. Um, but you know, in the 60s and 70s, electrical analog computers were used quite heavily before digital computers could do anything useful. So here's, uh, you know, some, here's some shot, screenshots sort of from a brochure from the 60s for a, a desktop computer. Um, you know, and, and you can read, it says, you know, analog simulation is a dynamic method of solving the problems that confront the engineer and scientist daily, right? And then they're talking about you know, problems in aerospace, and chemistry and biomedicine, so you know it's all kind of the same thing, right? Um, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> and you know, so what does it mean? So what does analog simulation mean? So you know, what this thing is is it's basically a bunch of op amps, you know, configured configured as integrators and adders, and then you have punch cables, punch cords, like an old operator, so you can connect them together to make a certain circuit, and then you have a bunch of potentiometers, so you can set time constants and things like that, right? So you, you create a, a circuit that has a, a, a equations of motion that are the same as a system of interest that you want to study, and then you just let the thing run, right? And you measure the time evolution, and that's your simulation of the, of the circuit, or that's your way of solving the, the problem. So you know, that's how we went to the moon, uh, by the way, right? Um, <clears throat> and so what is analog quantum simulation? It's basically the same idea. I'm gonna build a, a now a quantum device. In our case, it's gonna be a circuit, a superconducting circuit, but it could be atoms and all kinds of things. Um, but I'm gonna build a quantum device with the same now Heisenberg equations of motion of the system that I'm interested in. And then I'm just gonna let the thing run and measure it, and that's going to be my simulation, my way of calculating what the system does. Um, and there are many ways of doing quantum simulation. The one I'm going to talk about is a kind of a very broad platform called photonic lattices. These are just a couple papers that say lots of people think about it in different ways. So this could be optics, it can be microwaves, it can be atoms. Um, well, I guess photonic is more optics. But anyways, uh, you know, but the basic idea is that I have, you know, a bunch of nodes, which are some, you know, could be cavities, resonators, something like that, that can hold a photon. And then I have some kind of connection or some graph of links between these nodes, um, you know, and this lattice defines my, uh, my simulation. Um, and, you know, this can be mapped to a lot of different lattice models in, you know, fundamental field theory or condensed matter and everything like that. You know, lattice models are very popular. Um, an interesting feature, you know, for instance, pointed out by this paper, I don't know that it's the first, is that um, in a lot of these platforms I can do something interesting. So in general I'm, I'm adding some kind of tunnel coupling between these nodes. 
But if I can make that tunnel coupling complex, or if I can give it a phase, right, um, then I can do interesting things like simulate uh, gauge fields, right? Um, and the way you can think about that is if I can make the right pattern of phases here, now my photon hopping through this lattice has a path-dependent phase. And if this phase has, these phases have the right pattern, I could think of that phase as coming from some fictitious gauge field, right, or the line integral of a fictitious gauge field. Um, and then I'll also show in this talk that with these phases, we can uh, you know, study topological and chiral dynamics and lots of interesting things. <clears throat> so on to Hans. Now the relax. <laughs> oh, okay. Woo. Um, okay, <laughs> I got too close to the mouse. So now I'll talk about our particular system, which is a photonic lattice, which, as we'll see, is programmable in situ, um, which I think is good for a simulator. Um, and we're doing it with what I call a parametric cavity, so a superconducting microwave circuit. Um, so what is the, the basic parametric cavity? So you know, the basic system is something I've been working on for a long time, starting from when I worked in Per Delsing's group at Chalmers, um, so going back to 2006, 2007. Um, and the, the basic idea is we have an on-chip uh, uh, transmission line cavity. So we have an on-chip transmission line. On one end, we cut it with a capacitor, which allows us to do input-output and also fo forms one boundary condition. And on the other end, we, we shunt it to ground with a squid. And what we need to know right now is that the squid basically looks like a tunable inductance. It's a tunable boundary condition. Um, and by putting a flux through the squid, I can change the boundary condition, which changes the resonance frequencies of the modes in the cavity, right? Um, and importantly, you know, squids, I can modulate the frequency from DC to tens of gigahertz, right? So I have a lot of flexibility. Now, we, we may, we've made amplifiers out of these things, but for, this, for these purposes, for this kind of quantum, or for the photonic lattice, we want to have lots of modes. So we just make the cavity very long, so the fundamental frequency is low. Um, this is kind of an old device where it's kind of two gigahertz, but we've done now like 100 megahertz or something like that. So you can put lots of modes into your measurement bandwidth. So I have lots of modes to play with, and these modes are then going to become the nodes of my, quanta, of my photonic lattice. Um, and then I'm going to couple them, and I'll explain the details in a second, with parametric pumping of this squid, so parametric pumping of, of the cavity. Um, and just to say, you know, as, as I said, we've been working on this for a long time. So at Chalmers, we did our, our first fast tunable cavity. Um, we did the dynamical Casimir effect as a crossover, one of Paris students working in my lab. Um, we did multi-mode JPA, and recently we showed that we could generate tripartite entanglement with, it, with this scheme, with multi-mode pumping. Um, and I will say, I think at this point, there, there's too many other references to, to list in detail, but lots of good work at Chalmers and Paris and Helsinki and Yale and NIST and, and lots of other places. So we're not the only people working on this kind of thing. Um, so to get into a little bit more detail of what we can do with this system and the kind of interactions we can create, so we, we just write down the, the Hamiltonian of the squid at the end of our resonator, right? And the basic idea is that we have you know, a tunable, an e, it's like effectively an EJ that's tunable with the, the pump flux. So this is our, the flux we use to modulate it, and this is multiplied by then the, the flux of the signals in the cavity, which is just the sum of all the modes. Um, and then what I can do to lowest order is I have a little flux bias, so I get a linear term here. I further say the pump is parametric, so I say it's a classical field at this point, so these are alphas now. And then, you know, uh, and then I'll expand the cosine here just to second order. And you know, for concreteness, I put in three modes here, but we can have many more, right? Um, and then the basic idea is that you know, when, I, when, I, uh, when I square this thing, I get many, many quadratic terms of kind of all the possible, you know, all the possible interactions or combinations of A and A dagger, quadratic combinations for all the modes, right? So it's kind of a mess. But when I, when I pump, I mean, the idea is that each of those quadratic terms in the appropriate uh, interaction picture will have a time dependence, right? And so by then picking a pump frequency which matches that time dependence, I can make a rotating wave approximation that picks out that interaction and all the other ones go away, right? So for instance, if I pick uh, the sum frequency of two modes or twice the frequency, 
I pick out terms like this, which is a parametric down conversion term, or if I pump at a different frequency, uh, I, can, I get a beam splitter coupling or coherent swap between the, the two modes, right? And what we've demonstrated over the last several years is we can put in many of these tones at the same time and generate many of these interactions. Um, and so in the a language of, of quantum simulation, you know, the way I, would, I could think about this is, you know, this term here, this beam splitter, you know, this is hopping or coherent tunneling. Uh, and this term looks like some kind of pairing potential like I would have in superconductivity, right? Um, and another important point is I have some, you know, I have some raw cup or G naught up here, but then this little G here is actually depends on the pump amplitude. So what the, how hard I drive increases the effect of coupling in the rotating wave. And it also depends on the pump phase. So I really get to make these couplings complex. Okay. A quick sip. So I hope um, you can kind of see now where I'm going. So the idea is now I have all of these modes of my cavity, um, which become nodes of my photonic lattice. And by turning on different pumps, I essentially define a graph of connections between these things. So what I make is a lattice in synthetic dimensions, or maybe even multiple synthetic dimensions. It can be more than 1D. And just by picking pumps, I can simulate different things. I can do a triangular lattice, a square lattice, a linear array, mm -hmm. all in one device, right? All in one cool down. So, that's kind of the introduction, and I want to talk about a few different models that we've simulated. I mean, kind of some in exactly the same device, some in sister devices, but the point is it's, you know, these are all done in basically the same device. Um, so the first one we looked at is something called the bosonic Kreutzlatter. So the, the Kreutzlatter is a quasi uh, 1D lattice model um, that has a cross-link ladder structure. So I have kind of two, uh, two 1D lattices, but there's cross-linking between them. Um, and then I also imagine that there's a magnetic field that threads uh, the, the ladder. Um, and it, this arose kind of in the 80s as an early toy model of chiral fermions in quantum field theory. Um, and then, you know, so despite its simplicity, there's lots of interesting things going on. So in particular, um, when I have a phi equal to, I have a, a flux of phi equal to pi, there are, are various topological states in the system. So first of all, I can have states in the bulk which become localized, um, which is related to a phenomenon I'll explain more called aronoff bohm caging. Um, and then I also end up with localized zero modes at the end or end states or edge states. So we're, we're gonna make uh, you know, a small version of this. <laughs> so we have four nodes, <laughs> um, which is kind of like two plaquettes. And, but I want to show you, I want to start to introduce you to the type of data that we can take here, right? So the first thing we can do is, so we imagine, you know, we have a few modes of our cavity, which are going to becoming our nodes. And I, I just do normal uh, scatter, you know, reflection measurement with my VNA, right? So I measure around one cavity node and I see some, you know, resonance curve, which is asymmetric because anyone who's done cryogenic measurements knows that they're often asymmetric. And then we can see, so this is with the, the lattice off, so no pumps. Right? And then I turn on you know, pumps in, in, this, in this way, so in this lattice, and you can see now basically this splits into four modes, right? So I'm, I'm coupling these four nodes together and I get four normal modes, right? With some splitting. So basically the, the idea is doing reflection off of one node gives me access to the energy spectrum of the system, which does actually still depend on the position in the synthetic dimension. So we can see a different spectrum at each node, which has to do with the spatial support across the lattice, right? Um, but, you know, I said we also have phases here, so we have a synthetic flux. So we can take this data now as a function of flux, and this is what it looks like. So here, we're, this is now our network analyzer frequency, where we saw the multiple resonances. The color scale is the reflection, and this is the, the lattice phase. So because it's a closed loop, the, only the, the phase around the loop matters, so we can just change one phase, right? And this is what we see. And already here, we see there's kind of a lot of interesting things going on, right? So I see kind of zero, maybe zero modes forming. 
um, you know, I see bands kind of merging together, but there's kind of a lot of structure going on as a function of flux, right? So in addition to using the reflection measurements to measure the spectrum, we can also do transport measurements to measure, essentially map out the wave function across the different nodes, right? So that's the idea. Um, so you know, here again, I'm saying I'm putting in a signal at A and I'm measuring what comes back at A, right? And this is our, our reflection, so we get dips, right? Yeah? What about the different modes here? Are these, these these different modes of one cavity? Yes, so it's different modes of one cavity. So they're at different frequencies, and so for these transport measurements, we have to do frequency conversion measurements, mm -hmm. or buy a fancy network analyzer that has multiple sources, <laughs> both of which we, we've done. So, you know, and then I can say, I can now do a transport measurement. So I put in a signal, I sweep around omega A, and I see what it comes out at omega B, right? So now I get peaks because there's nothing when, you know, I'm not, when there isn't transport. Um, and then I can do that for kind of all the, the combinations. So I can measure A to C um, and A to D, right? So I can map out the transport across the lattice, which we take as a, a measurement of, you know, as a proxy for kind of, the, the structure of the wave function across the lattice. So, you know, this state, and we can, which we frequency resolve, you know, say in this case, well, and then we can, yeah, do this all as a function of phase, right? So we're me measuring these curves, reflection and transport as a function of the, the phase again. And so we see structure like this. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So you have to spend a lot of time testing different micro, microwave generators and finding which ones have really good phase coherence. So it turns out, you know, phase locking <clears throat> at 10 megahertz isn't phase locking, it's frequency locking. So, you know, you have, to, you have to play with it. But this is the right generator, which is not, it's SGS from Rota Schwartz. You know, you lock them at one gigahertz um, instead of 10 megahertz, and then you just change the phase on the front panel. <clears throat> Right. So when there is no term, for example, if you go from A to B, yeah. then you said um, Or if there's no pump, I turn off the pump. I just turn so off the output. No phase, whenever you turn, you just get zero. So yeah, if I, if I have, yeah. Okay. Yeah, or you know, basically, the way I get zero phase here is from looking at the pattern. Okay. So I mean, you, you turn everything on, and there's some phase, right? Yeah. And, now, and then I sweep the phase, and I say, OK, based on what I know of the system, you know, based on kind of fitting, but I mean, it's pretty obvious fitting, I call this phase zero, right? <clears throat> so I, like I said, so we can do this, so we can measure all of the reflection coefficients as a function of phase, and all of the scattering coefficients, all the, tra the transmission as a function of phase, and map out the response of the whole system, right? And so, you know, this is, the left here is the experiment, um, and the right is the theory, so this is just a, a simple four-mode scattering matrix, um, you know, for parametrically coupled modes, so from the, the NIST guys um, that we just adapted, you know, and you have to deal with little microwave stuff. But we can fit things very well. Um, and, you know, I, uh, did I, I walk too hard and move the mouse around? Oh, there we go. Um, so you can see, for instance, already here that we see things like non-reciprocal transport, right? So this is kind of, you see the transpose elements here. What's red here is blue here. And what's blue here is red there, right? So these are actually, the off diagonals are complements of each other, which tells me that I have very non-reciprocal transport in the system, right? And, you know, which we can connect, you know, to time reversal symmetry breaking of our synthetic flux. <clears throat> but I, I also want to look at some of the, the modes that we see emerging here, right? Which we can connect, you know, it's a tiny system, topology is about big systems, but you start to see hints of things coming out, right? Um, so the, the first mode, so one mode we can see is at, at phi equal to pi, right? So these are the lines down here, right? And so we see, you know, we have, this is where our four states merge into two, kind of symmetric about zero, so I have degeneracy. Um, but you can see here, you know, this state now doesn't transport very much to B, this is the structure of the lattice. Um, and you can see that here, it's kind of the transport is pinching off here at this point, right? But then there's lots, of, there's plenty of transport or much more to C and A. So I have some kind of state that's kind of living on the, the corner here, right? And I have four of these corner states we can map out. 
Um, but how do we connect this to the Kreutz ladder? So we can kind of think about this as being this, uh, this trapezoidal plaquette or part of the lattice of the Kreutz ladder. And what's the idea? You know, so if I put an excitation here, you know, it can get to be two ways, right? It can go this way or it can go that way. But there's a pi phase shift on the lattice, right? So these two paths dis interfere destructively, right? So the system can't get here. Um, and that's the heart of aronoff bohm caging, right? Um, and that's what microscopically kind of leads, well, we connect this to flat bands or these, yeah, or the, you know, the, the localization in the system. So we see at least the precursor of that. Um, then the next state, so if we go to phi equals zero here, you know, we see we have kind of two modes that collapse to kind of zero energy in the rotating frame. We see there, and you see again that, well, this, this transports a lot to, you know, this mode, but much less to these two modes, right? So again, it's kind of pinching off there. Um, now, on, on our map of the lattice, this is, what this, this is what we had. So it's transporting well to B, which is kind of the far corner. Um, and we also have the C and D. Now, at the same time, I, I told you, remember, that it was phi equals pi that's interesting, not phi equals zero. But if I think about it, you know, I, I can draw these connections how I want. So if I twist this plaquette, right, um, you know, what I see is that, uh, you know, if I put a flux through, the top loop and the bottom loop cancel because they're twisted, right? And this happens in the Kreutz ladder. So the flux here is zero even for whatever flux I apply, right, the net flux. Um, and so then I can, and when I do this twisting, the modes that are captured here are now these modes on the, the end. Uh, instead of being across. So this is starting to look like our little edge modes or something. Okay, so that was the Kreutz ladder. That was published in PRL last year. Um, and so another model that we've looked at, and so again, this is getting, we have a programmable system, right, is the SSH model. So the SSH model, Sue Schriefer Higer, Higer um, and the same Schriefer in VCS. Um, so this was, so this is a, it's a tight bond binding or hopping model. So I have sites and hopping in between them um, with alternating coupling strengths. So I have strong coupling, weak, st strong, weak. Um, so originally it was a model of molecular dimers. So I have dimers that are strongly coupled that are then weakly coupled to each other. Um, and again, despite its simplicity, um, this has become one of the kind of paradigmatic uh, models of topological features or non-trivial topology. Um, so there's a lot of interesting phenomenology that you can explore in this model. So first of all, to see anything interesting, we have to assume what we call, or what is called chiral symmetry, which means there's no energy difference between uh, the two locations within the dimer. So if they're like particle and antiparticle, they're symmetric. Um, and then, you know, the, the feature is for a general tight binding model, I don't necessarily have a gap, but when I add alternating coupling, I open up an energy gap. Right, so now with the alternating coupling, I have a gapped model or like an insulator. Um, and then I have interesting things that depend on then whether I have an odd or even chain. Um, and this goes for however big it is because of the Kyle symmetry. So if I have an odd chain, um, I have one zero mode in the gap. Um, and that's because, yeah, I have one zero mode in the gap um, and that lives on one edge. And this isn't actually topological, it's just due to the chiral symmetry at this point. Um, but then if I have an even chain, if my even chain ends with closed dimers, this is the topologically trivial phase. Um, there's nothing interesting. But if, the, if it ends with the even chain, I have, uh, if, sorry, if the even chain ends with open dimers, then I'm in the topologically non-trivial phase. Um, and when I, and you know, so this is a plot from kind of a online court tutorial on topology. So what I'm plotting is, you know, they're kind of just calculating the energies of like a 20 site model. Um, and then this is the coupling strength of the kind of the edge band compared to the not edge or coupling. So on this side, you know, I have, on this side I'm in the topological, the trivial phase, and on this side I'm in the topological phase. So I'm changing the coupling. So in the trivial phase, I just have a gapped model. Um, as the couplings go towards tight binding, they're equal, the gap kind of gets smaller and smaller. But then on this side, this is where I en enter the, 
non-trivial topo topological model. And what happens is two of these modes split off from the, the band gap, or sorry, split off from the bulk and kind of crash towards zero. Um, so these become approximately zero modes that are localized on the edges. Um, and these are plots of the, the wave functions of various modes. Um, so you can see the, these two modes near zero kind of live on the edges. In an infinite chain, one would be on one end and one would be on the other. For a finite chain, they couple and they get even and odd superpositions. Um, and then you know, a random state in the bulk is kind of spread out over the whole lattice, right? So we can look at this in our, in our simulator. Um, so we'll start now with five modes. So again, same device. But now I'm just putting in different pump frequencies, right? So I'm programming a different lattice into the system. And so I can start with you know, five modes and actually just start with a type binding model. So I tune it up so each mode is coupled with five megahertz of coupling, right? And that's just adjusting the pumps, right? So they all have equal coupling. So these numbers will always be the, now the coupling rate. Um, and then I'm doing the same kind of scattering matrix you know, measurements here. But now because there's a loop, there's no, there's no meaningful, there's no loop phase, right? So there's only one phase to measure at, right? Um, so we just see one net network analyzer trace. But it's the same basic idea. Now the diagonals give me the energy spectrum and the off diagonals give me the transport, right? And for instance, what we can see here is that because it's an odd number, uh, it's an odd numbered lattice, um, there is a zero mode, um, but the zero mode is delocalized. See, it's just as strong in the center as it is on the edges, and this is what you would predict. And now we can go really to the SSH model. Um, so you know, now I just tune my pump strengths. So I make some weaker and I make some stronger. So I have now two and a half, ten, two and a half, ten. And what we can see um, is now my zero mode has localized to one edge, right? So I see the zero mode over here where I expect it because that's the weak coupling and there's no longer a zero mode here. And you can see it's kind of decaying and you can also see it in the, in the transport, right? So there's little transport to here and almost none to there, right? So the, the strength of the wave function is decaying. We can retune things again and now our zero mode moves to the other side. And then we can also do things like make a, make a defect. So we can break the pattern of the couplings and now it's like we have a domain wall in the center and you see now our zero mode gets pinned at the domain wall. <clears throat> and finally, um, yeah, so here we go to the actual, top, to an, uh, uh, actual topological version. So now I have a six site lattice um, where I programmed it so that we have the weak dimers on the end. So this is the topological phase. Um, and you see what we expect, um, where we get now kind of two zero modes localized on each end. I mean, you can't tell so well that these are decoupled, but this, the transport helps a little bit. So again, you can kind of see, you know, the, the transport dies off going, you know, for this one it dies off going this way, and for this one it dies off going that way. So we can kind of see this zero mode is localized here and this zero mode is localized there. And then I had another model to talk about, but I think I'm out of time. <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> Am I out of time? I have some time? Okay. Three minutes? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll dive in. Um, so another topological model, and this one is interesting because everything so far has been hopping, but now we're at the pairing, right? Um, so th this was a model proposed by Ash Clerk's group, which is the bosonic Kataev chain. So it's a hopping model, but now adding, you know, parametrically down conversion, but we could think of a simulation as, a, as pairing. So I call this the bosonic Kataev model, so we could remind ourselves what's the Kataev model of Majorana fermions, which is very famous now. So it's fermions, but the Kataev model is basically, um, I have, you know, a single a lattice that can host a single spin. Um, I have hopping uh, between these lattice sites, so it's like type binding, but then I also have a pairing potential that exists between sites. So we have some superconductivity in the model. So this is the Kataev model, hopping, pairing, um, and then Kataev showed that this could be solved in terms of uh, Majorana fermions, which are super, even an odd superposition of the electron uh, operators. Um, and uh, yeah, 
and you know, it's, there's been lots of excitement because it turns out it's topological and there are end states that people want to use for quantum computing and are having lots of trouble finding. Um, but, and, and also just to mention, you know, where does, what's the topology in this model? Where's my donut? Um, I keep always asking myself. So to see that, we can, we can transform that real space Hamiltonian into K space. And so I've written it now in a compact form where now big C is just a vector of little c's, C and C dagger. Um, and then I have, you know, this, sigma is just a vector of poly matrices. And then I have a kind of fictitious field which then encodes the, the actual information of the system. And in this case, this fictitious field has this form, right? I have, you know, no sigma x, then I have sine and, and cosine. And you can kind of see in your head, as k varies through the Baron zone, so zero or minus pi to pi, you know, this vector winds around the origin, right? Um, in the yz plane. And it's that winding is the winding number because the origin is a singular point for the model. So we have bosons. Um, so can, you know, which are very different from fermions. Can we still find interesting things in a bosonic version? Um, so how, first of all, how do we implement it? You know, we've talked a lot about hopping. So these are our beam splitter couplings. And then this is just down conversion, right? <laughs> so I turn on some down conversion pump and I have something that looks like the pairing potential. Um, and as it turns out, you know, well, and again, um, you know, if I, if I transform uh, to k-space, my fictitious field has this form. It's a little bit different, but with the right choice of the free space parameters, it still winds around the origin, so I get a topological model. Um, now, I, and I can again solve this topological model in terms of some kind of Majorana, which is a superposition of the creation annihilation operators, but anyone who does microwaves just recognize these as the quadratures of the field, right? So this becomes solved in, in terms of kind of Majorana quadratures. <clears throat> And, you know, so there's, it's topological, there's these Majoranas, is there still anything interesting? And to see that, I mean, the easiest thing to do is to calculate the Heisenberg equation of motion of the system. And this is what they are. And you see two interesting things, right? So first of all, X and P decouple. So the X and P quadrature decouple from each other, which is, I didn't mention, the Majoranas in the, in the Meyer, uh, Kataya model decouple from each other. Um, and then you also see that the transport is very asymmetric. So going in one direction, I have T plus delta, so tunneling plus pairing, and the other one I have T minus delta. So at T minus delta, this term goes away and the transport becomes completely asymmetric or completely chiral. So one quadrature moves in one direction and one quadrature moves in the other, right? So I get quadrature particles that, that propagate in a chiral fashion. So how do we measure this? Again, so we can tune up a, a simple system, a three model system. So we have pumps and down conversion. Um, we didn't have another phase locked, well phase locked generator. So what we did is we inject a signal now in the center here where we just, it's a constant amplitude but we sweep the phase, right? Um, and then we look at what comes out, the, the two ends, like the six and seven, the two ends of our, our model, and we see that we really get kind of an alternating phase. So, you know, one quadrature phase is going left and one quadrature phase is going right, right? Um, You know, and we can do this, there's lots of pump phases. <laughs> you know, we, we can map these things out. Um, you know, so this is magnitude and phase, reflection, you know, transport, uh, experiment and theory. And you know, basically what's going on is, what we can see is that you know, by, by changing, here we're changing the difference phase between T and delta, or the beam splitter and the down conversion. Um, and if those are, uh, and when we do that, basically we're kind of defining new generalized quadratures. I'm kind of changing my definition of X and P, right? And so each link has a different, def slightly different definition of X and P, and by tuning these things, I can line them up. So if they don't line up, I don't get transport across it. And if they do line up, then I get chiral transport across my, my whole chain. And I am now out of time, but I'll just say, you know, we can also see thing, fun things like in a closed chain, we can see chiral instability and things like that, but I'll, I'll stop there.
thank you very much for this interesting talk. And uh, yeah, yes, there is one question. Interesting talk, thank you very much. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but, but let's start with the most important one. So fir first question is, where, uh, where are the limitations of your circuitry uh, given the model that you want to simulate? Because at one point, the circuitry is, of course, not an exact uh, map of what you want to simulate. It's in yeah. certain parameter ranges. And, and uh, so to phrase it differently, H junk that appeared yeah. uh, during this conference several times, what's the impact and where does it appear H junk? I mean, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen. So uh, there's a lot of things hit, hidden in the phrase, tune things up. <laughs> so when you, you know, we, when you pump these things, we get lots of frequency shifts and things like that, and you have to kind of deal with that. Now, in these cases, we're not really getting, we're not putting, we're not getting down, we're not generating lots of photons, so we're not getting like per shifts. But you know, when you pump, you get shifts and things like that. Those are things we play with. And I think you know, at some point, you, you will hit a, a, a wall. Um, this. At some point, you know, I'm, I'm putting all of these tones into one squid in the end, right? And that squid will have a finite kind of dynamic range, right? So I, I, to me, that will be the, the limit of, I mean, I imagine that will be the limit. I think we've gotten up to like nine or 10 or 11 pumps so far. Um, and you know, it, it's still working. So you know, my sense is that you know, eventually, okay, this is nice because it's very hardware efficient, right? I have one cavity and I can do all this, right? Um, and one readout, um, you know, but I think at some point this could be, you know, a unit, you know, one part of a bigger simulation, you know, or, I mean, there's no reason I can't do this with individual cavities, because I think there'd be interesting things to do mixing, you know, cavities and transmons and, you know, and things like that. And then I can still use the parametric coupling, you know, I'll just have to have more lines, you know, or something like that, and maybe more readouts. So I think there's lots of spaces, places to go. Chris, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering how far can uh, this thing can be uh, really called quantum simulator? Because, yeah. uh, in fact, your your sort of uh, my understanding is yeah. a single excitation sure. oh, yeah. manifold. No, I, I, I it, it. It's classical picture. So, can you do, do yeah. doublons, for example, in uh, SSH model, uh, double excitations, yeah. localization, or things? Probably not. No. Uh, well, I, th I think at this level, I mean, you're right. So, you know, this is all kind of uh, the way I look at this is. What we're seeing is the energy band that we're creating, right? Um, and now there's a question, and so far all I put in here was coherent states. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I do a mode diagonalization and you know, that's a classical, not hard problem. But yeah, so I mean, that was my, my last slide. Um, where I, okay, I already quit. I mean, the point is, is what do we have to do to make it fully quantum? Well, first of all, we can put in quantum states. So we, we create this lattice and then we can load it, right? So we haven't done it yet, but you know, we can throw in single photons. You know, it's very easy to throw in uh, entangled states, right? We can throw in two-mode squeezing, and we're already doing it, right? So I think there's lots of quantum states of light we can load into our lattice that's interesting. I think the other thing is that you do want to start, I mean, what also can make things computationally hard to simulate is particle-particle interactions, right? And so that speaks to having kind of more nonlinear resonators. These are highly linear resonators. So again, if I went, you know, this is where I, I mean, I think, you could use this parametric coupling, but now with kind of discrete resonators, right? And I think, you know, essentially, I, I can go continuously with essentially the same Josephson junction plus capacitor. I can go continuously from very linear resonator to qubit to nonlinear resonator, which means, you know, photon interactions and things like that, right? So this exact platform is very linear. I can still load non classical states, but I, I, I think, you know, there's lots of things to do kind of in the same family. I think with nonlinear driving, so you know, we had a paper where we did, you know, uh, you know, cubic parametric down conversion or three photon parametric down conversion, and so like the you know the HALC group showed that if I if I use that, so if I use a not like a nonlinear beam splitter, so I couple one photon in one mode to two photons in another, so I, I could use an auxiliary linear mode, but I use this nonlinear pumping, I can split the mode of the, you know, I, I can split mode. So I can use a nonlinear pump, which we've demonstrated, to turn on nonlinearity in the linear mode. So I think that's another possibility, right? So I think there, there's lots of tools to continue exploring to make it more non-classical or, or more harder to, or harder to simulate. 
Okay, last question, but please be brief. <laughs> Uh, I was just wondering whether you are limited in the size of the chain regarding the room temperature hardware you need to stabilize all the phases, or are you limited by the saturation of the Josephson junction? I mean, so far, I mean, we, I mean, uh, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so far we're not limited by any of those things, or we weren't, I mean, maybe here we were limited by how many sources we had, and now we bought a bunch more. <laughs> Um, we haven't seen problems with uh, mode locking many of them yet. Um, so, you know, I think it will be maybe how much we can pump the, the junction that, that will limit, limit us eventually. I mean, but what's limited us so far and we're working on it is it just gets as a, you know, it's a tuning up problem like Frank talked about yesterday. I have these frequency shifts and I'm trying to tune and, you know, I tune one and it affects the other. So we're also working on better designs to reduce the frequency shifts and, you know, and things like that. <clears throat> okay. okay, let's thank Chris again.